Okay, so uh, we resume our activities. Next talk, uh, Roosevelt is going to uh, continue his course, and, and you know, so if you think you know it's too small, just you know, there are seats on the front, so come over. Right. You know, it's yeah. I'm going to write also a bit. Bigger. Uh, but it's hard, right? I mean, right. with the whiteboard. I mean, so. All right. So I just, uh, as I go along, I put some questions on the board. You know, the answers are not clear. So if you are interested to think about them or if you solve them, drop me a line um, or even if you are interested to do that. So I just put my uh, my email here. So R Hazrad at Western Sydney. Adieu. Uh, you so i would be very interested to hear your thoughts as we go along so let me just remind you what we have done we were talking about monoids and the monoid that we concentrate one of them is it starts with a ring r and let me just put the identity here so we are comfortable and then you get all the finitely generated projective modules and you don't want to distinguish between the isomorphism one, so you just collect all the isomorphisms and you just collect these and you call it VR. And if you have two addition by just putting them next to each other in a way. And that gives you an addition and the zero is a module and it's a projective, it's a free module by definition and would be the zero of this monoid. Okay. Now, let me just right away ask you two questions. So curious questions. One is this, if R happens to be commutative, then if I give you a projective module, you can, you know, apply, so if you have a module, you have an action of R on P. But if R is commutative, it doesn't matter which way you multiply. So it's a bi-module. So if you give me one of these modules, I can tensor it with another one. And gi that gives you another projective module, right? So now you see where I'm going. Previously, I just add them and I get a projective module. Now I tensor them and I get a projective module. So this means if you think a little bit, I get another monoid here with tensor products. So two different monoids. And when you pass it into the ring, the K0, so remember K0 is this group completion of this. Now you have addition, and you have multiplication. This behaves like a multiplication. You have to check these little things, but it goes through. So this becomes a commutative ring. So it's not only a group, it's a commutative ring. Okay. So now here is the first question. And I asked this question from a friend. Uh, that shows how old I am. Uh, and each time I see him, he says, oh, what happened to that question? And it's been 17 years ago I asked him the question. So, so you start with the R commutative ring. Then you get the K0 of R. Well, this is a ring. So get the K0 of this. Again, a ring and keep doing this. What happens? I mean, do you get, you just keep creating new rings or it stabilizes at some stage or it's a cyclic so it just gives you new ring up to some point and then so what happens i have no idea so 
So that's one. Oftentimes, when you're repeating, you stop somewhere. Oh, yeah. Okay, so that's one question, curious question. The other one, so you start with this ring R. Well, this could be non-commutative non ring. Then you have V of R, which is a monoid. Then I get this group, uh, this ring. This is a monoid ring. This is like group ring. Let me just remind you. Monoid ring, that means that the elements are just formal sums of Ri and Vi, Ri coming from here, Vi coming from here, and you can multiply them and so on. So that gives you a ring. So like a group ring, but here is the monoid. So then you can get the V of that again. Then you have a monoid, then you do R of that. And then you get, get the monoid and you keep going. What happens here? So if you were interested of, you know, what happens in the, here, let me know and we can go from there. Anyway, we are going to concentrate on this monoid, but for a particular case of Levit path algebra. And the beautiful thing is that this here, this monoid, which comes out of projective modules, so you have to know the abstract algebra, blah, 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 to understand this, you can just describe this in terms of just graphs. So it becomes the first year undergrad problem. So you can describe it to an undergrad student here and just work with it. So you have to, you can ignore the whole algebra and just work with it. So I'm going to concentrate you. Okay. So in order to work with that, of course, I have to define it and then go from there. So what is this graph monoid? Yeah. And when I saw that for the first time, it's in the paper 15 years ago, 10, 10 15 years ago, I thought this is so natural. How come people haven't defined this before, this ME? So let me just tell you the definition. So you start with a graph E, a directed graph. And you can, what I'm writing here, you can generalize in all kinds of directions, but imagine it's finite and row finite and so on. Then ME is a commutative monoid. generated by vertices. So by this one, I'm, what it means is that the free monoid, remember we talked about free monoid, generated by vertices. So maybe I could put this notation here. So you pick the vertices and you just, for each vertex, you get N. For another vertex, you get another n. So that n, that many copies of n. So so far, it's this is really this is just that many copies of n, depending on how many vertices you have. So so far, not much there. Subject to to these relations, and um. I write it this way, see if you don't like it, I can write it differently. So if you give me a vertex, this vertex is the same as you look at the vertex, you go along the vertex and you hit all the other vertices adjacent to that and you collect them. And I write it this way again, if you don't like it, I can write it differently. So you have the vertex V, you look at all the edges getting out of V and in this monoid, V is the same as the sum of the adjacent vertices. That's all, that's all that, that is for ME. And again, as I said, um, 
first time I saw this, it's so natural. Look, this is V. The, the worth of V is the same as the worth of this sum. So if you have $10 here and you give people, you distribute the money, just, just that, right? That's the relation. Okay. Now, I have to be more precise here. What does it mean? I say subject to these relations. If you give me in group theory, I understand that means I get the normal subgroup generated by this and do the quotient. If you give me in the setting of rings, I understand this means I generate the ideal and quotient. But here you have to be careful. What does this mean? Do you mean submonoid and then quotient? Then you have to be very careful. That's not the case here. So what this means, I have to write it here. So what it means is that I'm gonna define an equivalence relation which take into account this distribution and then define the monoid there. So I'm going towards an equivalence relation. On this free monoid. Okay. So remember this free monoid is just sum. You just formally put the vertices next to each other. So it's just sum of vertices with no meaning. Okay, it could be also a couple of V there. Okay, so if you have sum of VI, maybe I to N, I'm gonna define an equivalence relation. And at the moment, I just define this notation here one. I pick one of these vertices and I do this transformation and I leave the rest there. So just pick one of them. So this I goes from, uh, how do I write this now? From I equal to one to N, but pick one, the J one here. So you write VI and then for VJ, so the VJ left over. So for VJ, I'm gonna do this. So I write the sum of range of, or maybe I just write this VJ to W, W. I wouldn't type it this way in paper, but so here you have V1, VJ, we and I pick this one, I put the rest here, and for VJ, I do this sum here. So this is what I call one. Okay. And then I'm gonna repeat this. So anywhere you see you can do transformation, you do that. So I would write X goes to Y uh, with the red one. Oh, I see, I see. So red or black or both? Ah, oh, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> sure, 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 sure. Oh, yeah, too many inches also there. Okay, so this is just one step transformation of an element. You just pick one vertex and you transform that. Now, you can imagine... If I write this, that was one. If I write this, I mean, this X, this is sum of these vertices. I pick one and I do for that particular one. And then I can pick another one and keep going, right? So with this one, what I mean is you do the transformation as many, as many times as you want. Mm. Yeah, at the moment, row final. You're right. If it's not row final, we were talking with Daniel, uh, the, the monoid would be different in a non trivial way. But this is row final. Okay, so by this one, I mean x0, which is x, and then, oops, yeah, x0, which is x, and then you do a couple of these one, and you hit y. So at the moment also it's manageable. You just keep moving in one direction. Now the equivalence relation I define between these vertices, let me just write it this way. 
remember x is a bunch of sum of the vertices y is a bunch of sum of the vertices when do i make them equivalent if there is a chain starting from x and then you go with these ones but in any direction you want and that makes it very very difficult and you get to y so let's imagine what i'm saying here so previously you had x you pick one vertex you write the sum of them you are here you pick one vertex you keep moving in one direction but here i say x and y are the same if you start with, with x maybe you pick one and you get here but then maybe well another one but then maybe here there is something which goes toward that you just keep that and then continue and that makes it very very difficult if i tell you x and give you hand you two x and y and i say if they are connected because what are the chances which way you have to go right okay this is an equivalence relation you have to check not very difficult and respect the addition in fe and this is what i mean by the monoid subjected to these relations okay so let's do one exercise um, imagine your graph is this Can you show that U and W are the same in here? And that shows you that I'm not going in one direction. So I start from U and I want to say that I reach to W and I cannot just push these things and get to W. I have to do both ways. Why is that? Well, I get u, the next step with 1, u is the sum of these two, so it's v plus z, that's fine. But look, v and z, there is nothing getting out of v and there is nothing getting out of z, so there, you cannot transform them anymore. This transformation is valid if there is something getting out of v and so you stop there. But then from w, also you get v plus z. okay so this is me so let me just write a very compact definition of me here me is the free monoid with over e0 subject to all the vertices of this form okay so this is a graph monoid and we are going to work with this but i want to uh, link this with this puzzle i mentioned in the very first time so remember we had a couple of puzzles they are kind of related to this one of them was this one that you said uh, you send a cat and then you get a dog you send a dog and then you have a dog and a cat and a rabbit and you had the rabbit here so you were playing this game and the question was if a cat you can go back and forth back and forth the back and forth is is like this one you know you can go back and forth and get four cats Well, this is a kind of a newspaper puzzle. Now, can I give a mathematical model? So I put the cat here, cat here, dog here, and the rabbit here. And a cat 
gives me a dog. So this is the relation. A dog gives me a dog, cat, and rabbit gives me a dog, a cat, and a rabbit. A rabbit gives me dog and cat. So in this graph, now, a cat here, cat is the same as dog. Remember, if I want to write it, dog is the same as cat, dog, and rabbit. And the rabbit is the same as dog plus cat. Stare at this, stare at this. And can you convince that these are exact relations here, i.e., if you want to solve this, you look at this graph and you're working in this monoid because these machines are translated into these relations and these are exactly these. So I'm working in here and my question is if C is equal to 4C in this monoid. So this is a connection. And you might say, oh, okay, so so far you didn't solve it. You, you kind of just translated into different language. You didn't give me any solution. And I say, yes, but maybe I can develop some language, some tools now because I have mathematical sort of language, some tools that tells you, at least helps you to solve this four equal to C equal to four C. And I'm gonna do that right away now. I'm gonna give you a lemma it's called confluence lemma that helps you with solving this. So what I want to prove or give is that um, if you give this puzzle to someone, what he would do, okay, so he would go back, forth, maybe he goes from cat to here, maybe you have to go back, here, 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 right? And going back and forth. But the lemma says you don't have to do that. If you want to so, show that C and 4C are equal, so one cat and four cats are equal, just concentrate on the left and move just in this direction. It's easier, right? You start with cat, and then move in this direction all the time. Never come back, just one direction. 4C also go in one direction. And if you hit the same thing, then they are equal. So this is much easier, right? In fact, you can then write a computer program. You give C and just ask uh, the computer, give all the transformation that you can possibly do with C. 4C, you do all the transformation that you can do with 4C, and somewhere if they hit and would be the same, then they are the same. So in one direction, going is easier than go back, going back and forth. So that, that's the confluence lemma. So let me write it down here. So let X and Y be in this graph ME, in this monoid ME. Then X is the same as Y. Again, I emphasize in ME. So in your head, you have to remember that means that I have a bunch of vertices here and I go like this, transform this in some directions and I get to Y, right? In all kinds of directions that I can go. If and only if there is a Z, now this time, and this helps, it's very rigid. Z is just a bunch of these vertices, some of the vertices, and x, you can go all the way to z, and y, in one direction, go to z.
Yeah, I mean, you can start with X and Y being in FE, but then you are translating here, X and Y. In the, yeah, so. Yeah, I mean, that's another language I can use, right? So FE here, and I say this is equivalent. And then that happens also. Yeah, so I can write it this way or, uh, yeah, I just write both both ways. Yeah, uh, maybe you're right, because if I l say I l lift it, then it's not well defined it, because X can be lifted in many different ways. So maybe, I, yeah. Um, no, I think it's okay. So I have FE, let me see. In FE goes to ME, if you give me X, yeah, there are many ways I can get to X. Yeah, maybe I, you're right. Maybe I just put it this way. This is more accurate. Right, okay. So now let me just write the proof. See if I can do the proof here. Proof. So first of all, remember that means that I have a bunch of steps to go from X to Z, bunch of steps from Y to Z, right? So suppose X is equivalent to Y, as really said. So this means that there are a bunch of steps. This is X is equal to X zero. Then I have X one, then maybe X two, X three and so on. And you see what I want to do. I want to use the induction. So I'm in this situation. And I eventually want to say that if you have X and Y and a bunch of these, eventually you can produce in one direction and you get to Z. So how am I supposed to do that? OK. So. If this n from here to here, this is the nth step, is zero, i.e. x and y are the same, then I don't have to do anything because they are already approaching itself. If x, this n is one, I don't have to do a step one because I already convinced you step zero is okay. But step one, either you are in this situation or you are in this situation. And that's fine also, that means that X and Y approaching the same thing here. X approach Y and Y is already in Y. So N equal to one also is okay. Now, suppose it's correct for N minus one and I want to do N. So suppose if you have X and you with N minus N step you get here, then suppose it's correct, that means you can push x minus 1, and you get to z. <clears throat> now I want to go one step further, and I say there is a way to go here also to z or something similar. OK, what, how can I do this? Okay. One of them you should see, I mean, there are two options here, right? In my, either I'm going from x minus 1 to y, or I'm going from y to x minus 1. Which way is easier to prove? Either you're going from here to here, or you're going from here to here. Say it again. Again. The second one is easy, of course. Thank you. So if you are in this option, then there is nothing to do. Because look, x already gets to z, and y gets to x minus 1, which goes to z. So 
this is good. So option one, option two, and this, as you said, is good. Now, what if I am in this situation? So how am I supposed to go now to some Z or something here? Now you have to remember, these are one, right? Each of them is one step. Now you have to remember now, first time, the definition of this one. The definition says that you look at this, you collect one of the Vs and you leave the rest there. Then you call it the, the sum of the rest. This is T. So you, you pick one V and you transform that. So the V, let me write it bigger also. So you have V plus some other things. T, let me call this, this is the rest. Then you transform V You know what, I just write V bar for the transformation of V, plus you don't do anything with T. So this is the transformation you do. You pick one vertex, you change it, the rest you just put it here. So now I'm in this situation. Now, well, fine, and here you are going down. So how can I get this bridge now from here to here? Okay, so now let's concentrate on this sequence here, and I'm gonna just not right wave a bit hand. So let's look at this sequence here. In each step, you pick something and you do the transformation, right? In each step, you pick one vertex and you do the transformation. So now go through this. The first step here, imagine you don't pick V, right? So V appears plus some T bar, right? I'm not doing anything with V. Okay, now I'm here. You do another one. Imagine you don't touch V. So the V is still here, and then you do something with T, so T double hand. And imagine I go through the whole thing, and I would not touch V. So you go all the way, and I have V plus some T prime, OK? So now here, I don't touch T, but I have changed V, right? Here I have V plus T prime. So how can I, you think, how can I go from here to here? So let me just try again. At the very beginning, you have V plus T. You don't touch V, you touch T. So maybe I call it T1, transformation of T to T1. Next step, V is still there, it becomes T2. That is, it becomes TK. So now you have V plus TK here, it's Z. And here Y is V bar, which you manipulated V, but you haven't done anything to T. How can I now go from here to here or somewhere? Else? Say it again. Yeah, 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 right. So to which one, to which one? Here I have V bar. Somehow I have to create V bar here. Yeah, because I have V bar. So there is, you know, I changed the shape of V, but it's still here is V to V. That's right. That's exact right. So here you have V. I just do the transformation to V and I keep TK. So now I'm here. Now I start from here, V bar is this V bar, don't touch it. Just keep moving T to the next one. And I got there. That's it. Now this is the first, you know, uh, in mathematics you divide the option. So this is the first one, namely through this you don't touch V. So now, what if you touch V somewhere in the middle? What happens then? That's exactly right. So that's exactly right. So here, so I have V plus T1, V plus T2, but here I have V plus TS, and the next one, I don't do anything to T, I change V, so V bar plus TS. Well, 
from here, V bar has been changed, and I just change the T, and I get in the middle, and in fact, both of them now continue to Z. So then maybe as an exercise, you want to prove that C is one cat is the same as four cats. You start with C, but don't use any machine going back. Don't use this way. Just keep going in one direction. The theorem says that it should happen that they get to the same thing. Okay. Okay, now I'm going to study ME. Now, let me tell you two questions that if you look at, there is, of course, this book, Levit Path Algebras. So the book. By Gene Abrams. Uh, Terra Ara and Mercedes Molina Silas. And there are two questions there that they say, you know, among the, the most sort of elusive questions, I'm going to put them here. And it's guaranteed because it's been 15 years or 20 years now. If you answer any of them, it's guaranteed you can publish it in very good journals. So one of them is this. Question number one. So you have two graphs, finite graphs. And I'm going to give you a simplified version so that there would be no headache. So these levy path algebra, when you look at with coefficients in a field, are purely infinite simple. So just ignore this. Just imagine that E and F are, so they, are, they have no source, no sink, and strongly connected. So let me explain. As I said, this is kind of a simplified version, but if you just do this, you have done the whole thing. So, so you start with two graphs. There are no sources, so you don't have, you are not in this situation. There are no sinks, so you are not in this situation that stops there. And strongly connected means all, any two vertex, vertices you get, they are connected. So everything is connected, right? So highly connected. So you are in this situation. Any two ver vertices you give me, this is connected to this with a path, and this is connected to this with a path. So everything is connected, right? Then it says that if you look at ME and get the group completion of this monoid, so ME plus, which is just the K0 of LE. If there is an isomorphism here, to M F plus, which is the K zero of L F. And it happens that the sum of V, so this is one distinguished element here, the sum of all the vertices E is finite. So this goes to the sum of all the vertices in F. And you can see that this is just L E. And you can see that this is just LF. If this happens, then these two algebras are isomorphic.
and that means uh, I think again very, these are very very special because I'm I think Leo mentioned to you that this k zero of this thing which is just you can realize as graph also you can write it as just adjacency matrix one minus adjacency matrix of e or maybe transpose and then this is a map from z n to z n n being the number of vertices and you get the co-kernel so very nicely you can write you know you can just put this in a computer program. You, may, you have matrices and you calculate it. So immediately you can get K0. Um, again, this is an algebra, you know, with addition, multiplication, stuff like that. But it just tells you that they are isomorphic if these matrices, you know, somehow related. So very interesting. Okay, so this is the first. Now as a test example, so test example, Let's look at two graphs. See what happens with this statement in these two, gra two graphs that I'm gonna write. One is one vertex and two loops. So let me call it L2. The other is the same, but I'm gonna attach a bit of a tail here. This is not there. Okay. L2 minus. Okay. So, question Is these two are the same? The Levy path algebra of these two are the same. So, maybe I call this, okay, whatever. L2 is isomorphic to L2 minus one question. So forget whatever I've said so far. I'm just asking you if you have this graph and you get the Levit path algebra and I get this graph and you get the Levit path algebra, are they isomorphic or not? Any answer you give, any answer guaranteed to be published in a good journal, even if it's one page. Because here, That mean you mean okay so yes these are these are uh, cycles yes not going in one direction you're right these are cycles so they are involved okay so now if question one is true then question two is true question one gives you question two so let me check that for you so let's calculate the k zero of L2. So what's the adjacency matrix of this? So the adjacency matrix is you get, you arrange the vertices here and you put the number of edges going from U to U. In this case, there are two edges going to from U to U. So this is U, this is the adjacency matrix and you do transpose is the same. Okay. And minus Identity, well, minus one. This goes from, I'm just writing that uh, fancy formula. I'm just writing this in that setting. So from Z, because one copy is of Z, because you have just one vertex, to Z, and you get the co-kernel. Okay. So two minus one is one. So I get one Z to Z. So that means that I'm sending X to X. Well, it's an isomorphism, so it covers the whole Z. So co-kernel is just zero. So K zero of L2 is zero. It has just one element. So I just immediately can say L2 has to be that element also. So do the same trick with this one. Now you have it three by three, right? Three, one, two, three. You have a three by three matrix and there are some numbers here because you have rows and arrows and you minus one, then either take your time and do this or just use computer to give you a diagonal. You can always get a diagonal up to, and then calculate that. And you see that K zero 
of L2 minus is also zero. And then of course, L2 minus is also zero. Well, look, the K zeros are the same. LE and LF represent the same thing. So if question one is correct, then I get that L2 is the same as L2 minus. So if you would be, if you would be able to prove that in reality they are not isomorphic, that would be even more interesting. Okay. So I'm gonna maybe finish with now a question. I think it's it's kind of a cute thing. I'm gonna put another question. I raise another question, and it would sit here. SC. Let's call it SC. Okay. That if question one is correct, the, this one that I'm gonna raise is correct. And if this is correct, then this is correct. And the way this is defined, maybe there are other tools to approach it, right? There are other tools to approach it because this has been studied in many different cases, not on the levit path algebra setting, but in other cases. And then of course, if this is false, then question number one is false. So what is that question? Again, it has something to do with this finitely generated projective modules because I'm working with ME really. Okay. So there was a paper in 1955 by Jean-Pierre Serre. And you know, Serre is one of the the most celebrated math mathematician of 20th century. So he has won every award available in mathematics. And then he raised this question, but somehow it became, it's called Serre's conjecture. I don't know how it flipped from a question to a conjecture, but now it's known as Serre's conjecture. But anyhow, he said, imagine this is a field. Just think of real numbers or complex and then get this polynomial ring. So this should be very familiar to all of us, just polynomials with a bunch of variables. Right? If you are not happy, just get two, right? With two. But any number I can put here. The question says, if any finitely generated projective module over this ring is free. Is any finitely projected module is free? Is any projected module free? So as I said, uh, it, they, they call it Serre's conjecture. Although again, in that paper, it, it's, it's a kind of a question. Okay, first of all, if k, you just have no variables, so k is just a field, then you are working in linear algebra. Any module, anything is vector space, so anything has a basis, so anything is free. So over fields, question, so let me call it SC, is correct. This one, you have to read the proof. I actually was looking at the proof the other day. This is a principal ideal domain. So that means any ideal is generated by one element. So this is used. So here also it's classical that any projective module is free. That's also true. Then came with two variables. So what, what can you do here? Now, the other way, let me just tell you something before we go here. Already people knew, and that shows you that, you know, 
you know something about k0 is not enough. People knew that k0 of this is z. Of course, if the projective modules are free because this is commutative and it's IBN, k0 is becomes z. But we knew that this is z, but you could not say that any finite generated module is projective. You could say that any finite generated project, projective module is stably free. I, at some stage, I write the name. So if you have this, then projective modules are stably free, but it doesn't mean it's free. So this was known for a long time, but this question was still there. Okay. The other thing that I actually was very, very surprised because at some stage I was working with division rings. So the difference between a division ring and a field here, every, yeah. Yeah, you are ahead of me. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I'm still in 1950s. <laughs> but the one that I really surprised, I was surprised, really, really, is that, look, division rings is exactly like fields, but they don't, just, the elements do not commute. That's all, okay? And the whole linear algebra would go through, in a way, with division rings. So if you have a module over D, it's like a vector space. It has a basis and so on. So modules over D also are free, similar to this. But amazingly, Sarah's conjecture is not correct here, although you thought these coefficients are not going to play a role. But the Sarah's conjecture is not correct here. Okay. Now I'm still in 1950s. Okay. And now I have a no very, very nice story to tell you. So what I'm going to tell you now is a little paper that I wrote with a colleague, which raises that question of Sears conjecture on the setting of Levy path algebra. So this is a joint work, very short paper. So I wrote this very recently with Rango Suwami. Rango is in the University of Colorado. And it's a joy to work with Rango because he's so energetic and he's so passionate. And here comes the punchline. So this one here was proved by a famous mathematician called Sishadri. Do I have it? In 1958, so just for two variables. And Sishatri at the time was Rango's mentor. So Rango was undergrad in 1958. Now, 64 years later, he is as passionate as then. 64 years later, we, are, we were working on this. Okay. So now, the question we, we thought maybe it's true, and before that I just said, so eventually this Sarah's conjecture was proved in 1976 by Dan Quillen in USA and Andrew Suslin at the time USSR, kind of independently and amazingly the same year, but this Sarah's conjecture is correct. Projective module, so there is no kind of non-trivial projective, finitely generated projective modules here, non-trivial one. They're all free, okay? So they are just boring direct sum of the ring itself. So here is the, let's put it as a conje Sarah's conjecture. So I would say E finite, And then you have, of course, your levy path algebra. If any finite generated projective over this is free, 
like Sarah's, then this should be one of those original algebras defined by Levitt. It should be one of these LN. So it should be coming from either one loop, two loops, three loops, and so on. So in a way, if this would be correct, it's very nice because it says that you can distinguish these original ones with the, the rest of them. You know, you have all kinds of graphs and you have all kinds of algebras. At the moment, there is no way, I, at least, to distinguish which of those gives you this, the original one. Now, two, three, four, and so on. But this one that gives you a test that if all the finitely joint projectives are free, it has to be these original uh, levy, which just the loops. Okay. And I'm going to prove that this conjecture is going to sit between those two questions. So in a way, it's you know it's a nice observation, I would say that you have another thing to look at. And maybe for this one, you move from different ways. So let me give you one uh, a reference for, for this Sears conjecture. So there is a book by Lamb, T.Y. Lamb in Berkeley. It's called Sears. Now here, there's a problem. And it's 440 pages. So you see it's, you know, it, he collects all kinds of information about this conjecture in that book. And in fact, I was looking at that book. Some part is, is talking about non-commutative rings. So Sarah's conjecture is talking about polynomial rings, which is commu it's a setting of commutative rings and the tools you use are commutative. But in some of the sections, he talks about algebras like uh, whale algebras, which are non commutative and he discussed the Sears conjecture for that. So I'm thinking how much time I have. Uh, so the aim that I have here for this section is that I prove that Sears conjecture is sitting between Q1 and Q2. And the whole game is working with this confluence lemma in ME. How much time do I have? Five minutes. I always don't. OK, so let me just give you one of these lemmas, and then I stop there. So lemma, so you have E, you have ME, and you have Levit path algebra of E. And I think, OK. Let me just write this. The Sears conjecture is correct, is valid, if and only if, for any vertex you get, is the same as some copies of 1E in ME. So I reduce the whole thing working with these graph algebras. 1e is a notation for sum of all the vertices. So you just collect all the vertices, you just add them, and I say 1e. Then, if any vertex you pick is the same as some copies of 1e, uh, this should not be zero, right? If that happens, then the Sears conjecture is correct. If Sears conjecture is correct in me, you have this one. Again, you see, these are the things I say. It's not very difficult. If you have an undergrad, you can just ask an undergrad student, figure out the graphs that any V I give you, it's just this one. And you know, this is kind of easy to grasp because there is just one relation you are working with. Now, proof. So I'm going to use this one, ME, we know 
why ME is important because it's a monoid coming from this algebra and the relate this is an isomorphism and the relation is a little v goes to this particular projective module v times the whole thing so this is somehow you can think of all the paths starting from v or the path sort of ghost paths coming to v something like that and then one e exactly represents l e so once you have this it's very i think it's very easy to see this lemma So let me see if I can get this or I get stuck. So suppose, suppose Sears conjecture is valid. Suppose Sears conjecture is valid. So any, any projective modules is free. Any projective module is free. So in particular, this is free. So VLE, it's a projective module, but it's free. So there are that many copies of LE. Push it into V and push it into ME. This means that VLE is the same as K copies of LE. Now I'm working in VLE. Now push it to ME. That gives you that V is K copies of 1E. And something similar, you can go backward. So this is not very difficult. As soon as you know this isomorphism, which is absolutely non-trivial, is correct. OK, so now let me finish with this one. If somebody asks me, could you give me a projective module which is not free? The first thing I try is this one. Because it's not easy, actually, to if you give me a projective module which is not the direct sum of. So the one that I always think is this trick. So uh, a trick. So get any ring R and get this matrix ring MN of R. And then look at this one, this arrangement. R, everything R, R, and everything else is zero. This is a module, left module over MR, because you can multiply MR with this, and always you end up with this one. Is that correct? Yeah. So this is a left module here. And it's projective also, because Remember, projective modules is that you put another chunk here and you get n copies of your original ring. So if I add this with, can you tell me with what? To recover MNR, maybe? It's kind of clear, right? This bit is there, so I, I don't need to cover this. I put the rest R here. Put them together and you get M N of R. So therefore, this is a finitely generated projective. OK. Now, the rest that I'm talking is a bit philosophical. Namely, if you show me this, it's finitely generated projective, right? And you say. If this is supposed to be free, that means this is the that many copies, right? This would be this. But then in my head, I would say, how is it possible? Because this chunk is always zero. But you have mn of r and mn of r, so the rest are also numbers. How is that possible? You put this together, and then here would be zero you know you know intuitively so 
this would be one of the counterexamples I would try to say, to look at in Levit path algebra. So I look at the Levit path algebra, I look at the MN, and then, well, I have things of this sort. But I know that this can be realized as another Levit path algebra. Now I put the cell condition here and see what happens. Maybe the question I said here that this would be isomorphic to LN fails already here. So I, next time I start with this as a test example of the conjecture, see what happens if I put Sears conjecture here, namely I'm working with this, dealing, forcing this kind of finite general projective modules actually be free, right? How is that possible? See what happens. Okay, I continue next, tomorrow with that. Thank you.